You know, I'm not a fan of TV drama. In my early 20s, I recall watching a couple of episodes right at the very beginning of Coronation Street. In those days, there was only one TV channel in New Zealand, and it was in black and white. Now, that dates you. And, but everybody in the society was raving about Coronation Street. And after watching two episodes of Ina Sharples prancing about in her hair and, with her hair and rollers, that's an indelible memory, I recall asking myself the question, has this done anything for me at all? Or was it somebody else writing some drama and playing with my brain. I came to the conclusion that I'd achieved nothing out of watching it but wasting two hours, and from that day forward, I have never watched TV drama. You cannot interest me in the soap. However, I'm somewhat drawn to history, and I love particularly the period of the Reformation and its development over the 15th and to the 17th centuries, and the modern period of the Second World War and the recovery of Europe after the devastation and destruction that Hitler had wrought upon uh, that area of the continent. But I was fascinated particularly how Europe and especially Germany recovered from the massive uh, devastation and destruction wrought by Hitler. And today we have the results being that in the EU because they have made a state, they're making a statement that they will never go through that same destruction that they underwent. But what I never realised was the extent of retaliation upon German citizens and German speakers by the Russians, the Poles, the Czechs, the Hungarians, the French, after the peace was settled in May 1945. And I was flicking through some history channel, the History Channel the other day, and I came across a program called 1945, A Savage Peace. And what it had in there was a real revelation to me. Did you know that literally millions, I'm not talking about 100,000 or 10,000 or even 100, I'm talking literally millions of German women were raped after the end of the war, after the peace was declared by the citizens of the countries that they had gone to war against. Literally at least three million Germans were killed or German speaking people were murdered after the end of the war. If you lived in Czechoslovakia and you spoke German, it was most likely a death sentence. You know, we move on, we don't remember those things. We remember that we won the war. We don't remember the devastation that retaliation caused. The veneer of civility is, in mankind is extremely thin, and especially so when we feel hurt or abused. So today we're going to look at what the Bible says about the subject of retaliation. Interesting, the Bible has two completely opposite views on the subject. The first is found in the Old Testament and the Torah and the first five books of the Old Testament. Leviticus 24, 19, 20, it's many other scriptures in there, but you'll, this is probably one of the main ones. It says, if a man causes disfigurement to his neighbor, as he has done, it shall be done to him. Fracture for fracture, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. As he is called disfigurement of a man, so shall it be done to him. And this was the basis of what the Jewish religion called the law of retaliation. Now we know that Jesus the Messiah came to fulfill all the requirements of the law. Might I add there's been much discussion about in commentators about this subject. It's a very eclectic subject called antinomianism, but cutting it all short by simply saying what it's all about is that when Jesus died upon the cross, he brought an, he brought an end to the Mosaic law, that's the law of Moses, and he replaced it with a royal law in the New Testament. 
And the royal law is given to us in Matthew 22. And a lawyer, a Pharisee, came to Jesus and, and was testing Jesus. And he said to Jesus, okay, he said, tell us what the most important, what the greatest law is. And Jesus turned to him and said these words. Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these Two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So the whole of the first five chapters of the Old Testament are reflected in those two laws. And James in the New Testament, James 2 verse 8 writes, If you really fulfill the royal law according to Scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You do well. The problem is that in the English language, when we read the word love, we translate it into the context of how we feel love. It's, we take it as something that I want. We fail to understand that the New Testament word for love in the Greek is agape, which is a uniquely Christian word, and it means to give love, not to receive love. It's a giving love. And that's what the difference is. We live in a society which is absolutely bound by people running around wanting to satisfy their own needs and their own loves. But the Bible is different. The Bible teaches a love which gives, not a love that takes. If you go through the Ten Commandments of the Old Testament, you'll find only one, the fourth, is not a relational commandment. The fourth one, of course, is keeping the Sabbath, and that's expounded on in Hebrews chapter 4. And it teaches us that when we become Christians, every day becomes a Sabbath because we live at peace with the world. We're in absolute peace. We walk in peace, at rest, not having to strive or struggle because our faith, we're walking in faith with our lives in Christ's hands. But Christianity is not about rules or regulations and laws. It's about letting the royal law of love rule your relationships and your life. And love is, I love that description given to us by C.S. Lewis, love is desiring and acting for the highest good of others. So today for a few minutes, I wanna talk about love and, its, and retaliation. And the view which is held in the New Testament, which is opposite to that of the old. The first thing I want to share with you is this. And Jesus, talking on the Sermon on the Mount, said these words in Matthew 5, 11 and 12. Blessed are you when they revile you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets who were before you. Now this is, as I said, is part of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, that fantastic uh, sermon that is probably the best sermon that's ever been preached. And here Jesus totally reverses the Old Testament law of retaliation. Jesus says, bless those that persecute you, bless those that hurt you. And the Apostle Paul says the same thing in uh, Romans 12, verse 14. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Do not act against them. There's many other scriptures in the Sermon on the Mount that, or verses in the Sermon on the Mount that we could use about turning the other cheek. Don't retaliate. But we always want to protect ourselves. Our innate reaction when somebody hurts us is to try and get back at them. But here's the point. We're blessed by God to be a blessing regardless of how we feel. And that's the great test that we as Christians face when we've been hurt or gossiped about or unjustly dealt to by others. And I want to say this, that's hard. It's not easy. I know because I've been, I've been there, I've been attacked unmercifully by those who should have known better. And I've had to learn through that process to bless. How? By blessing on how I've been blessed by God. 
focusing on that. How have I been blessed by God, I should say. Drawing on God's blessing and giving it away to others who don't deserve it. I'm going to say that again because that's the key of God's love. We are blessed by God to be a blessing. And we focus, do we do that by focusing on how we've been blessed, how I've been blessed by God. I draw on that blessing and I give it away to others who don't deserve it. Because that's exactly what God has done to us. That's what John 3.16 says. It's often quoted as the most important verse in the New Testament. For God so loved the world that he gave. He gave it away. He, he didn't take, he gave. That he only begotten son. He gave us a way to come back into relationship with him. We were rebellious people. We lost our relationship with God. God in his love gave us the opportunity of coming back to him. That whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. We didn't deserve it, but, still, but God still gave us of his best. So the first thing is this. When you're hurt, feel blessed. Be blessed. Be blessed by God. Secondly, understand, be protected. You know, we don't have to protect ourselves. Think about that. But our innate reaction is to protect ourselves. Again, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, but I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. Pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons or daughters of your Father in heaven. You know, we this morning dedicated little Josiah Luke Cluley. Do you know who his biggest protector here is on earth? His father in the natural. You know, when my kids come to me, and I say my kids, they're adults now, but they still come to me with challenges and my natural reaction is to protect them and to find a solution for them. But you know, there's tr some tremendous scriptures in the first two chapters of Ephesians. And they say that when we come to Christ, we're in him. In Christ, in him. It's about 15 times that phrase is used in the first chapter or two chapters of Ephesians. In him. And when you're in him, you need to understand you mean you are under the blessing of God. You don't need to protect yourself. We're blessed by God. Let me tell you a story. Back in 1983, I knew I had to buy some land in Auckland to be used to build a church and build God's kingdom. And I remember waking up early one Monday morning, two o'clock in the morning, and as if I was suspended above the Green Lane roundabout, and God said to me, that's where you're going to have to buy the land. And to cut a long story short, what happened was that the next week I was able to put the deposit down on number nine Mariwa Road, and the same day I was able to put a deposit down on number 23 Mariwa Road. Interestingly love enough, we were just at that stage a small church. We didn't have the money, and somebody lent me the, the money for the deposit on the basis that it was paid back in two years, which happened. There's a lot more I could say about that, but I'm going to keep the story short this morning. But later on, I was negotiating to buy number seven in the street, number seven Marua Road. And another businessman entered the market and began buying houses in the street. And he came to me and he said, okay, he said, look, I'll tell you what we'll do. You buy number seven and I'll, buy the, I'll, I'll go for the rest of the street. I had no money. I couldn't argue with him. And uh, I couldn't disagree with him. I had no money to stop him. But he went straight from that meeting to the people that I was negotiating with in number seven and said to them, Terry doesn't want to buy your property but I will buy it 
instead of him. Oh, you, you, I know you guys want to go into an old folks' home and you're wanting to sell your property. Oh, here I am. I'm sent. I'm going to be your saviour. I'll pay it for it. So we bought the, bought the property. When I, found about, when I found out about it, I felt, dear God, here's somebody that has lied to me, done a disservice to me, gone behind my back and thwarted the vision that God had given to me. So what did I do? Every day for the next three years as I drove to the office in my car, I stopped outside number seven, I wound down the window and I prayed. And what I prayed, I named the man by name and I said, God, would you bless that man? Bless that man in all his dealings. And the second thing I prayed, I, say, I said, God, forgive me for not being smart enough to understand what he was like and negate the negative things he did against your vision. Forgive me, God, for what, for what I'm part. I only took a couple of minutes, then I drove on to the office. I did that every day for three years. And three years later, we were having a celebratory service one morning, and I invited some friends to come along one of whom was a real estate agent. And as she walked out of the service, I shook hands with her and she said to me, listen, she said, I've got some land for sale in the street. Would you be interested? And I said, where in the street? And it was basically the part of the street the businessman had bought. And what had happened is the businessman had suffered, suffered some health problems and the court had taken over his affairs and appointed my friend by the court to sell the property. And I bought the land at a very good value. That's a whole other story. Didn't have any money, but that's another story how we got the money to buy, pay for the land. But because I gave a blessing, and because I was sincere in asking God to bless the man, it wasn't just a something, it wasn't a mantra that I, I prayed. It was a heartfelt thing. God, I want you to bless him. God bless me. You know, we, you may have gone through a similar challenge. You might be going through it right now. Your vision dashed, your integrity trashed, your actions misinterpreted. What do you do? Bless them. Bless those who persecute you. Bless those who wrong you. Bless and curse not. But I promise you, as you do it, it will become easier and easier. And here's the best part. No root of bitterness will come or take hold in your life. So when you're being bullied and your purpose trampled, one, stop and be blessed. Draw strength from your relationship with God. Draw strength from that relationship and to be protected. Know that you're protected. Know that what God has said to you is protected because you're in him. So be blessed and be protected. Then thirdly, be different. Matthew 5 verse 14, you're a light to the world, a city that is set on a hill that cannot be hidden. You see, if you, when you're un, if you do those two steps, when you're, when you're, when you're spitefully used, when people are nasty to you, you be blessed and be protected, you will be different. You will show yourself that people will watch you to how you react. And that will affect how you show yourself to the world. You won't have to say or do anything special except bless and love those around you who are persecuting and being obnoxious to you. Now that sounds easy, but I want to challenge you today, it's difficult. It is not easy, I can tell you that. I know how hard it is and how hard I've had to do to make it happen. You have to consciously change how you think and act. Your natural Inclination is to react in such a way to protect yourself and protect your ego, protect your, yourself. So how do you be different? Here's what you do. Two steps. One, you pray. God, help me. 
strengthen me in my spirit. God, I'm weak. I'm taking a hiding. I'm taking a battering. I need you like I've never needed you before. That's your prayer. And secondly, you bless your detractors. And you don't stand aside and do them with a, with a general statement. You, you name them. Name them. Name the person and ask God to bless them. At times I've felt like when I've had to do this, I've felt like adding with a brick. But I've had to keep that to myself and trust God to do it. And God does it. Just a short, simple prayer and it will do wonders for you. Just remember that you're blessed, you're protected, you're different. And your light will begin to shine like a city set on a hill that cannot be hid. Let your, Matthew 5, 16, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. So be blessed, be protected, be different. Finally, be loved. Be loved. Matthew 5, verse 10. Blessed are those who persecute, who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You are loved by God. You know, to be loved is probably the most powerful emotion we can ever experience. And love is the principle of the kingdom of God. In the Old Testament, they lived by law. Obey the law and you will enter the kingdom. In the New Testament, it's not law, it's love. Desiring the highest good of others. And if you ask God's spirit into your life, you will now experience the unconditional love of God and you will know what it is to be in God's kingdom. Remember, a kingdom is, a sh that word kingdom is, a sh is an abbreviation of king's domain. It's where king rules. And we're in, when we're in God's kingdom, it's when God's blessing and love rules through our lives. In Luke's gospel, we read the parallel account of the Sermon on the Mount. It's, it's more condensed than Matthew's account. But this is what it says of what, that Jesus spoke. Luke uh, 6, 27 and 28. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who spitefully use you. That's the admonition of scripture. It is not easy at all. I can, I can tell you, it's hard, it's difficult. But as you break through on that point, you will find God's release coming into your life and God's blessing coming into your life. Love your enemies. And God showed us this principle in action when Jesus came to earth. Here was God's rebellious creation. Man thumbed his nose at God and ignoring God and doing its own thing. But God is love. And we say that, but we don't really understand the depth of what that is. And God reached out in love to provide a way of redemption to mankind. And that's where we get that wonderful verse of John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And with that redemption, God comes into our life, firstly to redeem us from our old way of living and secondly to empower us to love those who hurt us. Let that settle into your spirit. God's love empowers us to love those who hate us. And that's why I'm a Christian. Having his spirit in my life enables me to draw on the power that is beyond my natural self and to love my enemies and love those who spitefully use me. It enables me not to retaliate from my own self or from my own ego, but retaliate from his love. So be blessed, be protected, be different and be loved.